Hi everyone, my name is James Byers. This is my final project presentation. Uh, my topic is ETL via Apache Spark. This is for CSCI E63, which is Big Data Analytics. So let's get ourselves started. So today I'm going to talk about the problems that we're trying to solve using Apache Spark for ETL. I'm going to talk more about what Apache Spark is. I'm going to show you a demonstration uh, and get into some actual code and a working example. <clears throat> so my problem statement. ETL jobs generally require heavy vendor tooling that is expensive and slow, with little improvement or support for bid data applications. If you've ever used any bid data uh, or any um, ETL tooling, you know that it seems to be, be very proprietary. Um, it's difficult to test, it's difficult to gain reuse, uh, and, it, and it just seems to be inefficient and um, not even talking about how it doesn't work well for bid data applications. So the overview of, my, of this technology, Apache Spark. Uh, Apache Spark is a general purpose solution for cluster computing. It's not just for ETL. You can, uh, Spark has APIs for Python, Java, Scala, and R language. <clears throat> Spark supports the processing of structured or unstructured data. The example I'm going to provide today is going to be an example of structured data. And Spark runs on top of the Hadoop system. Uh, makes a lot of improvements over just your typical match, map reduce process. Some of the components that we use for this demonstration our Spark CSV reader. Uh, it lets you extract, we're going to use it to extract raw data from CSV files. Um, another cool feature is you can predefine the schema of your CSV files. You can tell it what data type to infer, uh, or you can tell it to just infer the schema, and I'm not going to tell you what kind of data it is. Um, uh, we'll get more into the weeds in a few moments. User defined functions. So when using a data frame, the data frame API has many, many different um, functions built in. But sometimes you just need to write your own. And I thought it would be useful to provide some examples on how to write your own functions. So we're going to see an example of that. Data, typical data frame functions um, that are built in. So filtering, ordering. Um, combining data frames with other columns, etc. We'll show some examples of that. And something that I haven't done before is JDBC connectivity, so connecting to and loading tables in a relational database. Um, so let's, uh, let's get into the code real quick. The first thing that we do, and I've, I've tried to make the code easier to read by providing these large blocks here, is uh, our, our extract phase. So in the extract phase, I, I declare where my source files are. Uh, and by the way, this is really cool. So the source files live in this data directory, and I'm mapping anything in the data directory by using this asterisk. On the left over here, I've opened this data directory, and you can see that the data directory has a bunch of other directories with files in them, and I've opened a few just to show you. So each directory is the four-digit year, two-digit month, and two-digit day of, in 2016. Um, so <clears throat> Spark just lets you, let you, lets you point to this, this higher-level data directory, and it says, okay, any file I find in there or any of the subdirectories, we're going to go ahead and, and pull in. The next thing I do is I define the schema. Remember earlier I said that you can, you can define the schema or you can let Spark infer uh, your data type. So I chose to define the schema. Uh, I have a few different fields. So I have a stock symbol, which is a string, a date, which is a date, and then some pricing information. I said that it could be up to 38 digits long um, and up to two decimal points. So let me just crack open the, one of the CSV files and show you. Um, there we go, zoomed in. So these are my data. Is um, I decided to use. I grabbed one year's worth of United States stock market closing prices. 
Um, and in this demonstration, I'm going to apply a few transformations, and then I'm going to load all of this data into a relational database um, for processing or, or, or for whatever we want to use it for. We could also use it to load this data into a data warehouse um, for further use by multiple different applications. So this is, of course, just one. So my data, as I said, I have a symbol, there's a date, there's an opening price, a high, a low price, the closing price, the volume of transactions, and the adjusted close. And this adjusted close, we're going to do something with it, uh, but it's really about how, or, or if something happens, like if the stock declares a dividend, or if there's a stock split, or and I think there's a couple other cases where we would have an adjusted close, it would be represented here. All right, so back to the code. After, so so <clears throat> finally we say, okay, I Spark, go ahead and read this CSV. Here is the source file or the directory of source files, and here is the schema, and then I call cache. Uh, this holds the data in memory. And just to prove that I read the file, um, <clears throat> I, I just did a count of the number of rows. Um, and I'll, I'll run this for you in a moment. So the next phase in ATL is the transform phase. This is where I did the user-defined functions. This is how you do it. So you define a function to run. So for instance, I said extract month um, from this date. At this point, I have null rows in my data, so I have to do a check if, if the date is none, which is Python's null type. And if so, if the date is not none, then I'm going to grab the month from it. And by the way, this date uses Python's date time dot date uh, module. So you can just call dot month or dot year or dot day. There's many others you can use. So I declare this is down here th that um, this is one of my user defined functions. Here is the function and here is the type I expect. Simple as that. So the next thing I want to do is I want to append <clears throat> um, these transform columns to my data frame. So you do that by using this dot, this with column, and I name the column, and then I provide this user defined function and the existing column name that's used as input to the function. Um, and then just to prove it again, I uh, did a count and I printed that to our terminal. So the next transformation I want to apply was to filter out any null symbols. Um, I don't know why there are null symbols in my data, but there are. So let's remove them. Here I use the data frames filter function. So by saying symbol is not null, I'm saying give me every, apply this filter to every row in the data frame. And if it's true, give it to me. If symbol is null, filter it out. Um, so then I, I print that out to, to show that there are no more nulls in my data uh, and then I do a little mathematics to figure out how many rows I actually removed. The next step in the ETL process, not really, um, but I, I stuck it in here because I wanted to see, um, I wanted to be able to grab some analytics out of this is I, uh, I ran a couple of things. So I wanted to know what the average closing price was for each month. Uh, so the data frame API makes this really easy. I said, okay, I want to group everything by uh, the month column and then run this aggregate function and average the closing price. Uh, and then to make it beautiful, I said alias it and give it this alias. Um, and then to make it even more beautiful, I decided to order the result by uh, month. So you could see for each month from 1 through 12, what's the average closing price. I print it out to the screen. Um, <clears throat> the next analytics, a analytical function I decided to run was to figure out how many times, or, or for each month, um, how many times was there a, a, uh, a, a closing price that was not the same as the adjusted closing price. So first thing that I want to do is take my data frame uh, that was cleaned and removed nulls from and, and I remove 
um, I filter everything out where this is not true. So if close the closing price equals the adjusted close, remove it. Otherwise, keep it. And then I apply the data frame group by a function, and I group by the month, and then I count, and then order by the month so it's easier to read in this presentation. And then I'll print it out. The final thing that I did, uh, or in the ETL process, is the loading phase. So in the loading phase, um, I decided to write this to a Postgres database. So you can see here I've, I've defined where this database runs. I'm running it in the same host, um, just in a Docker container. The mode tells um, Spark how to write the data to the table. So here, um, if there's a duplicate key, overwrite it. Um, and that was just like, and continue to run this over and over again. You say what user, what password, very secure password, uh, and then just print some stuff out. This is where the actual magic happens. This is where we actually write what we want to write. So I write all of my data frames, or, or all three of those data frames, to the database. <coughs> um, so the, the data frame that has all the nulls removed, and I've added the year, month, and day columns. Next, I write those analytics tables, so the average closing price for each month in the year and then also the adjusted close price different than the close price, the count by month. Uh, and then we finish up. So let me run this for you, or at least kick it off. Should just take a minute to, to rip through everything. Uh, so Spark here is starting up. So we go, it's saying that it is it's doing its thing. While that's running, we'll jump back over here to the slides. So uh, I talked a little bit about the data and the whole process that we're running through. Um, so speed. So for two point, uh, there's about 2.9 million rows. It's actually closer to 3 million. So when I run this in a VM, I give it 2 gigs of RAM and 1 CPU. It takes about 3 minutes and 14 seconds. If I jack that up to 8 gigs of RAM, 4 virtual CPUs, then this runs in a minute and 28 seconds. And that's, that's pretty quick for 2.8 million rows. I will say the majority of the time spent is, is, writing to, um, is spent writing to the Postgres database. So I think it actually runs in, in less than 30 seconds. Uh, maybe even faster and the rest of the time spent is is on the right so looks like I forgot to start uh, my Postgres database all right so we have a little error there I found that I forgot to start the Postgres database uh, actually forgot to start docker which runs the Postgres database so obviously it couldn't be running so here I just said, okay, start up, and then start the container that runs the database. Um, so let me kick this off again, and it should be a lot faster this time. While that's running, uh, I was talking a little bit about the execution time. Actually, that was the demo. I was supposed to pull this slide up first. Oh, well. Um, <clears throat> so so that you don't have to try and read my screen as it flies by I grabbed a couple of screenshots <coughs> excuse me uh, of the of the um, data frames that we're printing out to the screen and I put them in slides hopefully this is a lot easier to read so the raw data loaded so you can see here I have the symbol the date open high all the different columns from my raw data I also see that there's a null row right here, uh, one of those rows that I'm not sure why I have. That's fine because I can remove it. Um, it's saying that it only, it's only showing the top 20 rows and here are 2.9 million records. Um, so there are those analytics um, or the, the data frames printing out to the screen as they fly by. <coughs> so the next screenshot is after I tr applied all the transformation functions. So you can see I've now added the month the year and the day columns. Um, this may make it easier to run some analytics in the future or, or do some other queries. I, I just want to show an example. 
uh, I also um, printed out how many null rows I'd removed. So I removed 251 nulls. That still leaves me with 2.9 million uh, rows in this data frame. So a couple of the analytics, or the two analytics functions that I ran. So the average closing price for each month in 2016. Um, well, that's a, that looks like it's trending and going up. That might be helpful if I knew what to do with this information. Um, another analytics function that I ran. The number of times the adjusted close price was different than the closing price in 2016, grouped by each month. Um, so what I expected to see was something more quarterly, uh, and I'm thinking quarterly dividends, but it looks like it's kind of a, a spread. You do have the quarterly. I also see there's some mid-year activity, um, and then there's some end-of-year activity. So, uh, yeah, be that what it, what it may. Um, so here I have everything's completed. The thing I didn't grab screenshots of were, was the data actually loaded into the Postgres database. So I do want to show that. So here I'm connecting to um, <clears throat> the Postgres container. I'm going to open up a shell. Um, so if I list my relations, you can see that I have the adjusted close count, uh, the stock data relation, and the average monthly close relation. Um, so if I just want to do select star from stock uh, data, excuse me, data. I'm just going to limit this to uh, 50 rows, otherwise this could get out of hand. Um, so it prints everything out for me, so I have loaded data. Um, we'll do one more. So if I say select star from, what was another that I had? The average monthly close. I can print all of those. So that should look very similar to the screenshot. Um, the short I think that's all I have for the presentation. You, you'll be able to find this on my GitHub account. I'll make sure and put uh, the full source code. I'll put it here once I push everything to GitHub. Um, thank you for watching, and have a great winter break.